What is up, wrestling fans, and welcome to episode number 645 of the Smart Out Moment Smack Talk Podcast Hot Tags of the Week, guest starring a drill in the background that'll be happening throughout this episode. I apologize in advance for that. You're not just going to be hearing the drill, you're also going to be hearing me, Tony Mango, as well as Robert E. Felice. You know the drill. <laughs> and Callum Wiggins. <laughs> Hello there. Uh, drill Maloney, not on this podcast. But yes, uh, that will be potentially in the background. Uh, I'm going to filter that out as much as I can. But yeah, uh, it's New York. It happens. So um, if you want to drill in your thoughts of what you have to say about all these hot tags in the comment section below, that is the best way to do that. But of course, you can chime in with your opinions on all different sorts of platforms. You can send us a tweet at Smartout Moment. You can post something on Facebook. You got the page on SmartoutMoment.com. You got the Discord, of course, over there. If you don't want to just type out that link as it is up on your screen right now, you can just see the little handy dandy link on the right hand side of smartcomama.com. Click on that, join the Discord service over on that side. You got the uh, other stuff on the Smart Place, though. If you are over there on YouTube, make sure you hit the like button, make sure you subscribe, ring that notification bell, click on that thanks button if you want to pass a little spare change our way. And the join button is the same thing as the Patreon. Both sides give you gas blah, 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 give you access to the dark cast tier, the pick your poison tier, and so on and so forth. Now, of course, the dark cast we just recorded over this past week got into the raw after WrestleMania, which there's not too much that we're gonna like even recap again for this episode of the hot tags. It was uh more of like a spontaneous, hey, let's talk about the raw after WrestleMania type thing. But also got Rob's opinions on WrestleMania since he wasn't on the post show for that. So if you want to know what Rob has to say about Mania outside of just waiting until those opinions factor into talking about backlash and different things, go back and check out that dark cast episode. And you know what? If you uh, want to help us out on the monetary side of things outside of that, you got Redbubble and T public for merchandise, uh, whether it's smart cow moment, fanboys anonymous or a mango tees, all of those can give you entry points for the Funko pop contest, which is still going on here for another day or so i think I, I don't honestly remember exactly when i have it set to shut off so take advantage of that while you can just in case and go to the page over there get all your entries sorted out to win a rocky my via funko pop it's all sponsored by fun.com they're the ones giving this away so give a shout out to them thank them for that and of course, there's also the Smart Madness tournament going on, which is actually over. And that is the first hot tag to talk about here is who won the 2024 Smart Madness tournament, which was who is the top WrestleMania main eventer or who is, you know, the most synonymous with it, who is the guy that can call himself Mr. WrestleMania main eventer in whatever fashion you want to kind of phrase that. And the finals had came down to... I was surprised that it wasn't Hulk Hogan against John Cena, uh, Hulk Hogan against Roman Reigns, but it was John Cena against Roman Reigns. And with 60% of the vote, maybe it's a recency bias. Maybe it's just because he has the a distinction of being the most at this point, or maybe it's because he deserved to be in that spot. 60% of the vote goes to Roman Reigns beating John Cena. He is your pick for the... 2024 Smart Madness tournament winner pick for the Mr. WrestleMania main event. I think it makes perfect sense. What are you, you guys? Yeah, I think sometimes the numbers just add up and Roman realistically has been in some fun main events at WrestleMania, some not so fun, but ultimately when you have that kind of a record and it's been 10 years now, I think you have to be recognized as the guy in the same way that I think because we are kind of older fans, we were expecting Hulk Hogan to be there. Of course, the reason he's not is because people don't want to fucking give Hulk Hogan any props because he's a piece of shit outside of wrestling. <laughs> so that's why I came down to Cena, who surprisingly has less WrestleMania headlining matches than you would think. Good I think, yeah, I mean, I think Roman winning makes sense, but I don't know, it, it still feels a bit underwhelming. Just because I, I, Roman has the most number of main events. I don't think he's got the greatest record of main events in terms of match quality. 
Like, I, I looked through all of them, so it's what the match against Lesnar at the start, which is only saved by Seth Rollins cashing in. Uh, the Triple H match is one of the worst main events of all time. The Undertaker match, which is also one of the worst main <laughs> events of all time. All time. <laughs> um, the other Brock Lesnar match is one of the worst main events of all time. Uh, then, um, <laughs> Then, the, uh... the, and, and then and then it, and then it gets better with the tribal chief stuff. So it's really only the tribal chief stuff that's kind of saved him in terms of main event match quality. So, you know, I, I mean, to be fair, when I was looking through the entire list of the people, I say it makes sense that Roman wins and it's not like begrudging him a victory. But just looking at all of them, I was kind of kind of reminded with the idea of yeah, the main event is typically never really the best match at WrestleMania. Yep, that's what I was going to say because like. Given that criteria, who else do you put in there? Because, like, Austin's got a few, and they're fun, but it's not like, oh, man, these are the matches you have to see, you know? No, I mean, out of the over 40 nights of WrestleMania history, there are very few times that the main event is the best match of the show. (laughs) If I was honest, it really, to me at least, does go back to Hogan when you go... Yeah, his WrestleMania matches are typically the matches where you go, yeah, you should check that one out from that WrestleMania, whether it's the Warrior match or the Savage match or, you know, him slamming Andre. He typically did maintain being the focal point of WrestleMania while also, but then again, his cards were surrounded by shit. You know, that's also just a better time to be in now where, yeah, Roman's doing okay, but the card itself is much better. Yeah, the performers in the undercard are just like, oh, we're going to actually go out there and put a damn good show on and try to steal the show. And, you know, but I think it makes sense, Roman, winning this. I think uh, that was pretty much going to happen from the start of this. But, um, you know, if you guys uh, listening have anything you disagree with on that, Leave a comment below, like I keep saying, and uh, tell us why you think somebody else should have won. If it's like uh, if it's Brock or it's you know, Michaels or any other people that have been in this tournament, not a whole lot of people in the tournament to begin with. It was a very quick one this year, which that too is another thing. If you like that better, then you want us to have like more speedy Smart Madness tournaments over the years, you know, than what we've had. Then let me know about that. If you like more the traditional 32 seed bracket thing, let me know about that too. Of course. A big portion of why it was so fast this year was I completely forgot about it until we got later into March, and then I was like, "Oh, that's right, yeah, smart madness is the thing." Crap, let me try to do that. But you know, in some ways, I kind of like a short tournament once in a while too. So um, let us know about that too. A quick turnaround, if you would. A quick turnaround, yeah. We an unofficial quick turnaround. <laughs> uh let's see let's talk about some of these other hot tags that we got going on let's go back to since we talked about wrestlemania and stuff we already ran down wrestlemania we already ran down the nxc standard deliver show but we didn't talk about new japan sakura genesis or rh supercard of honor two shows that i did not really watch if i'm being perfectly honest i kind of saw a little bit here and there of supercard but didn't focus too much on it. And I didn't see a single uh, minute of Sakura Genesis, but um, you guys checked it out. So what'd you guys think for both, both of those shows? Yeah. Or, yeah. Specifically, I checked out Ring of Honor. I did not see Sakura Genesis, but I thought Ring of Honor was, you know, your standard fair Ring of Honor show it was fine. It had some nice moments with Mark Briscoe winning the Ring of Honor World Championship in a great match with Eddie Kingston. Billy Starks going full heel and feigning a neck injury in what was legitimately a spot where, as we're covering it, we all go, oh my god, oh dear, she's hurt. And then once I realized Queen Aminata was holding the ropes open for her too long, I'm like, something's about to happen here. And yeah, Billy Starks full heel, fully embracing Athena as her new mom, kind of after her mother was disappointed in her for her actions, I thought that was a great match and a great finish. And Athena and Sheeta killed it. So largely, I was thumbs up on Ring of Honor, and I wish that the TV show reflected that. Uh, for the most part, in terms of the Ring of Honor, I, I enjoyed the show, but I think it was, I think, noticeably the weakest Ring of Honor pay-per-view they've done since... The Tony Khan takeover. 
and just felt that it didn't have a lot of the matches didn't have the energy or the level of excitement that they've done for some recent sh- shows. And I think they, I honestly think that they actually probably put too much focus on the storylines that were built up on television rather than just throwing some good matches together for the show, which, which actually was to its detriment more than anything else. Um, best matches were Carl Fletcher against Lee Johnson. That was one of the best matches. And then the uh, Stardom's six woman showcase tag team match was really good. Um, then it's the, the tag title match was a whole lot of nothing. Uh, Billy Starks and Queen Aminata was good. And I think that the finish was good in concept, but poor in execution. I, I think that um, I know how Rob's kind of described it, but I knew from the second that she started feigning the injury that like she's not hurt because we well, put it this way. If someone suffered a legitimate neck injury, you ring the bell immediately or throw the X up. And so the match should be over. And then also you don't get them to their feet while they're wearing a neck brace. If they've suffered a neck injury, you know, you put them on a stretcher because you don't want to move them if they've actually suffered a legitimate neck injury. So I think that I think they went over the top in terms of the injury being caused and like her being taken out in that regard. I think it was a good idea. I just think that they they went too over the top with the the dramatics about it. Uh there's a six man tag match which is fine. Got Alex Zane on TV, so that was good. And and Minoru Suzuki was there, so that was fun. Uh Delta Castle Johnny TV was pro- probably one of the worst of the um the non the no DQ matches you get on these Ring of Honor shows nowadays. Uh Athena and Karshida was good. Main event was really, really good. Probably the best match on the card outside of the opener. So at least they opened and main evented it with the best matches on the show. So so that was good. But but yeah, overall slightly underwhelming, especially on a week a week and a weekend where there's so much wrestling going on. It didn't stand out that much. Now I did see the Billy Starks thing and I was like half paying attention at the time, so it totally got me. I could put my hands up on that. That like they caught my attention and I was like, oh shit, like she's injured and that sucks if that's the case. And I wasn't even thinking anything about the whole, like, um, like moving her too much or anything. Cause when, I don't know if you guys remember this, if you were watching at the time or anything, but do you happen to remember, uh, when Candace Michelle fell down in a match with, I think it was Beth Phoenix. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, she went up to the top row, got taken down, and just landed flat on her face. Mm-hmm. And it was like she was kind of like twitching and stuff. And I like I think of that injury a lot when it comes to certain other injuries, where I'm like, yeah, that was a legit injury. Like she did actually fall, and they just like she just dragged her and pinned her. And so there's like always this like kind of hesitation for me to go like, ah, oh, they wouldn't do that if. What? And then I'm like, oh, now sometimes they do. Unfortunately, move people around and stuff. So the Billy Starks thing got me. Like I, I wrote that down already in my end of the year awards to talk about as like one of my top like AEW slash ROH moment things. Um, the rest of the, the stuff like the lineup just seemed like it was kind of not doing much uh, other than what we kind of expected. You know, Mark Briscoe wins the title and so on. So it didn't feel like anybody had any real buzz about it that I would be like, you got to go back and check out this or something. But what about Sakura Genesis? Now, if some Rob and I didn't see it, but um, yeah, you know, how uh, how did that play out? Well, I only looked, I only went back and looked at because I I watched this or watched bits of it post the fact I didn't watch it live because it was you know it was a very busy weekend and I wanted to avoid resting as much as possible outside of the the, the big shows that I had to watch. But um, so I only really watched the big matches after I knew what the results were. Um, so. I mean, there's a couple of interesting things. I mean, there was um, a Bishimon, Goto, and Yoshihashi won the tag titles back, which is which is good because they needed to get away from Kenta and Chase Owens, even though they'd only hold it held it for a couple of weeks. They needed to get away from them as soon as possible. Um, but a club or dog still retain the tag titles. I didn't really watch those ones. I just know the result of them. Then I started watching the. Right about the final four matches. I wanted to see the first one, which was show defeated Yo by referee stoppage because literally a minute and a half into the match, uh, Yo suffers a dif- dislocated shoulder, and so they have to call the match off. Yeah. That's a re- that's a real injury where they have to 
you know <laughs> they called it off immediately and and then and so they had to basically stall for a time by having a couple of other juniors coming out and say they're going to challenge you for the title they're doing the the best of super juniors tournament coming up soon so we can kind of maybe talk about some of the people that were involved in that but um but yeah there was just a like just a, a freak accident which meant that this match between these two former tag team partners just got no real resolution or conclusion it was over as soon as it began and yeah so i guess we'll see what they decide to do with that moving forward um Chuck Rumino and John Moxley beat Renderita and Jack Perry, as to be expected. John Moxley pinned Renderita, which is makes sense because they're going to be challenging for the World Championship on a show that we will be talking about in a little bit. Uh, Shingo Takagi defeated Evil for the uh, Openweight Championship, which had basically had basically as much interference as the Cody and Roman main event of WrestleMania. Just, you know, with not as big stars. But arguably stars that make more sense to be involved in the story than the Cody and Roman match. Um, and then uh, Tetsuya Knight defended the title against uh, Yotsuji, retained the title, and you know it was it was okay. I I think it was a match that kind of exposed Suji's um, inexperience at like the very highest level because I think it was a good match, but it just he didn't kind of step up to an, another gear. I don't think Naito. And him had amazing chemistry, so so it was probably the best match on the show. But it wasn't a like absolutely great go out your way and see it matches like a solid like three and a half four star match. So what do you think the fallout is for this? And based off of the next upcoming shows, you got anything that stands out as like uh, something to watch for like possible title changes or new challengers established or anything? I think that would be where we talk about like when you see a riot and um and uh, potentially like the, the um super juniors tournament which is coming up soon because outside of that there isn't really anything else that's anything that's coming out of the show particularly which makes me feel like oh they're definitely going one way or another um I think it's uh, just a little bit you know uh, I'd say a few a few bits up here I think it's quite clear, both with the Wind City Riot card and what happened on this show, that Jack Perry is probably heading back to AEW, and so he's he's wrapping up in New Japan, taking losses on the way out. So, so yeah, and other stuff. There's no real direction for the tag titles. I think they're defending it on another show coming up that's happening like the day after Wind City Riot in, that's happening in Shanghai, I think. Uh junior title that's all going to be dependent on what happens in the best super junior tournament uh and uh yeah absolutely uh never open my championship um after shingo won uh gabriel kid came out and essentially challenged him for the belt but then also spent most of his promo talking about how um new japan has basically become aew's bitch that's essentially what he did he just came out and said why doesn't uh, hiroshi tanahashi just take his trousers off and bend over for tony khan Said that quite um, literally. That wasn't just me. <laughs> me uh, just typing only. <laughs> that, that was his literal phrasing. Was basically that. Um, and yeah, most of the stuff just bleeds into what we're going to see on uh, on today's show in Chicago. So, Rob, you uh, Rob had to step away a little bit. You you back, Rob? Nope. All right. <laughs> All right, so then let's transition away from the New Japan stuff. Pop on for with, um, I guess, something. Yeah, we got some AEW stuff. We got some WWE type stuff. Uh, if we're talking about shows that had just passed by, let's um, mention this. Another, you know, fallout from WrestleMania type thing. Uh, we now know why Stone Cold Steve Austin wasn't at WrestleMania and in that Undertaker spot that we all kind of assumed was supposed to be the Stone Cold Steve Austin spot. And it turns out, I guess, that it was the Stone Cold Steve Austin spot, but that they couldn't agree on the money. And that's always disappointing to hear because it's like, I don't know, there's a part of me that kind of thinks, don't you want to just be a part of this? And wouldn't you want to kind of etch your name into another big moment in history and get that big pop and, and get whatever the paycheck would have been. Like, I'm sure that they wouldn't have just not paid him. But if you are the type of person that you just care about 
you know, if you want to get the biggest paycheck and it's not worth the travel and the headaches of any of that stuff, then, you know, you got to weigh your, your pros and cons, but I'm disappointed to hear that if that's the case and that Austin wasn't just a little bit more willing to go along with it, unless we end up finding out that they were going to pay him like, you know, peanuts. And then it's like, okay, well, if he's going to lose money by going out there, by spending on the money on like his hotel and all that stuff, then, then I understand it. But, uh, it is a little bit of confirmation and um, makes us feel a little less crazy that it's like, yeah, okay, that was supposed to be an Austin thing, which makes a lot more sense. <laughs> How do you feel about that? Well, I think it's just the the general rule, which I've been saying quite a lot recently, especially when it comes to the WWE side of thing. Uh, fucking pay people. Uh, you're, you're a multi-billion dollar company. I'm sure Austin wasn't asking for half that multi-billion dollars. So, so, <laughs> like, so whatever he was asking for, if you really want to, I'd say, if you, if you were okay with just like, oh, I, we think that's too much money and we've got the Undertaker who's willing to do it for less, then that's totally their decision to do it. And I don't think Austin should, like, you know, fall back with the idea of, oh, okay this is such a huge moment i need to be involved in him like he's had tons of huge moments in his career does he need to really come back for like as cameo sport in a in wrestlemania 40 i I think he's probably okay with not needing to do that so if you are if you are very keen to have him involved in this then you need to stump up the cash for it and if they weren't willing to which is totally in their right to not do then then yeah then it's just not going to happen so yeah as i say i think austin and other people should be looking at that and saying like Oh yeah, it's, they, they've got they've got the money. I can like I can ask ask, ask for this much. And if you're not willing to pay it, then I won't be there. And you know that's that's basically how it goes. So so yeah, it would have made more sense for Austin to be there, and it would have been a good cool moment to see Austin come out and be involved in it. But the crowd popped enough when Undertaker appeared. They're probably more shocked that it was the Undertaker appearing in it because the Austin would have made much more sense than the Undertaker did. So maybe almost by having someone who peer that makes sense from a WrestleMania perspective and a legend perspective, but not from the whole storyline and but has, doesn't have the longest of histories with The Rock. Maybe that kind of works in his favour a little bit, but, um, but yeah, I understand why Austin wouldn't have uh, signed up for it if the money wasn't right. And it's also the type of thing that, like, um, not only is the pop a little bit different with the gong because people are expecting the glass shattering, but it's not like officially stone cold had anything to do with Cody anyway, where it's like, it would have been weird if John Cena wasn't the guy to go after solo. And it, that was undertaker. Then you would have been like, where's what? Like, how's this? Why is this happening? But they worked it out in a way that I think makes a lot of sense too. And, you know, kind of wreck on it to be like, Hey, undertaker's the gatekeeper of WrestleMania and you know, that kind of thing. So it worked out in the grand scheme, but, it does kind of make you think. I wonder if the glass would have shattered, how Jack Perry would have reacted now, <laughs> how it would have been, like uh, how much bigger or equal of a pop that that would have been, or lesser of a pop too. I mean, you know, could possibly be that option. Um, yeah, somebody's going to edit some kind of clip to that at some point, and we'll be able to kind of judge uh, how that would at least have felt a little bit. Um, I got a transition here over how oh, stupid drill. Sorry, everybody. Uh, transition us over um, to Cody Rhodes and, you know, the future of his championship and stuff. Uh, we know at least somewhat, according to Russell votes, not WWE.com because WWE.com decided to not bother to put anything out there about this. Um, they just have Cody's going to be on SmackDown tonight and uh, Bailey's going to be there. They haven't they said haven't. anything else. <laughs> yes, yes, they have actually. Oh, did they change that since we started? Uh, so five minutes ago on uh, Twitter, on WWE's Twitter, uh, Nick Aldis announced there's going to be two triple threat matches on uh, SmackDown with the winners going on to have a one-on-one match next week, and then the winner will face Cody Rhodes at Backlash. So the two triple threat matches are Santos Escobar versus Bobby Lashley versus LA Knight. And then in the second one is Rey Mysterio versus AJ Styles versus um, Kevin Owens. Yeah, out of that group, um, 
I don't think that anybody really stands out as like the obvious pick to go uh, for him. Like I could see an argument for a lot of different uh, ways for them to do this. Um, there, of course, there's some that like, yeah, you know, I mean, if they were to go with like Rey Mysterio, I would be a little bit more shocked than <laughs> if they deal with some of the other ones. Uh, out of the Owens, Rey Mysterio and AJ Styles, triple threat, I would lean towards probably AJ Styles. I could see an argument for Kevin Owens, but I think out of those three, I'd go for Styles. What about you? Um, I mean, I'd, I'd, uh, I mean, out of the three of them, the only one that won a match at WrestleMania was Mysterio. Yeah. So realistically, it should be Mysterio. Um, I think they'll go with. I think they'll go with Kevin Owens. And then the uh, Bobby Lashley, Santos Escobar, and LA Knight one. That could kind of go either way. Um, I, I, that three ways. Either way, either way. Um, part of me thinks that they might be setting up AJ Styles versus LA Knight in a rematch. And then that Styles beats LA Knight. And then that's how they get to Styles and um, Cody. But like these six names, it's not like Backlash being in France means, okay, that's clearly going to be this person. The way that like... You know, in Puerto Rico at Backlash last year, it was like uh, Bad Bunny's there and you got, you know, the LWO and like, yeah, you kind of build towards that. You can make the argument that Kevin Owens is fluent in French. Yeah, they might go in that direction. Yeah. And Um, Owens, if he's not going to just like win the United States title, you know, in some other kind of third attempt to fight Logan Paul, he's got to do something. So... Uh, well, I mean, he doesn't have to do something on this pay-per-view, but like he's got to do something going forward. And we're in a weird spot right now, too, where like backlash is going to happen on May 4th and the draft is now confirmed to happen prior to that. So they are not going to have any time to set up something new for these people. It's going to have to be one of those years where it's like, hey, the draft happened, but we're going to kind of ignore it a little bit. And then we're going to go into backlash with the implication that if anybody's on opposite brands, you pretty much know who's going to win. And if people are on the same brand, it doesn't really matter. But then that also kind of speaks to that too. Like if we get say, you know, Rey Mysterio wins this or Bobby Lashley wins this more than likely, they're going to be on the same brand as Cody, whether that's raw or SmackDown kind of assuming it's SmackDown, but, um, yeah, the way that these two triple threat matches work out, it's just going to set up the next match. So it's not a guarantee either way yet, but it will be at least a little bit of an indicator of how some draft things can potentially move around. And we know who is fighting Damian Priest. We got Jey Uso as the number one contender for that. So establishing some number one contenders for them, not the women's division quite yet. But maybe Bailey's got something on that tonight. But you're thinking out of this group of six, Kevin Owens versus uh, Cody Rhodes back Lash? Oh, no, I think it'll be Bobby Lashley. Oh, you think Lashley wins the other one and then beats Owens? Yeah, I think Lashley will be uh, I mean, out of these things, it's um, it's given me like one of t- well, two thoughts. First of all, the thought that I was worried about coming out of WrestleMania is that, yeah, Cody's just fighting mid-carders now. And it just feels like oh, I really wanted someone big and special to like help carry on this momentum, and he's now getting the, oh, I fight mid-carder treatment for the title now. As I say, these guys are more in the upper mid-card range, but still, it's like, it, it's nothing that has either the history or depth that Randy Orton feud or anything that, like, a big star like, say, Logan Paul, for instance, would be fighting him for the title. So, so it kind of already feels a bit like wishy-washy. It's, it feels like it's already going in the Post Seth Rollins, post Daniel Bryan winning the world title route for 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 Rhodes, and then um, yeah, the, and the reason why I think Bobby Lashley is because he has the most inbuilt history with um, Cody Rhodes because they had they had history back in uh, Impact Wrestling that they can kind of feed off of. So if you want to try and tell a bit more of a like interesting narrative 
between him and between him and whatever challenger there is because basically he has zero history with everyone else except like if they want to go about AJ and talk about bullet club stuff but that feels a little bit passe because they both AJ Styles was way out of Bullet Club by the time Cody Rhodes came in, so it would just be them say, "Hey, we were both in Bullet Club at one point." Okay, let's move on. <laughs> so, <laughs> That's the whole feud. <laughs> Rob, do you have any uh, thoughts on these six guys heading into um, this setup of the Triple Threat and next week for uh, who's going to fight Cody? Okay, so I think that. Callum's got a good point in Bobby Lashley. Lashley seems like a great fallback. Hey, we have a full-time world champion now. So Bobby Lashley is a great guy to fight that world champion. I think AJ Styles is great in a pinch. You know, that's that's the guy they used last year for Seth. When you needed a great world championship match, AJ Styles can deliver. I know he's had a rough end of 2023 start to 2024 but i do think he can be that guy my brain just defaults to solo you know my brain says that's the guy you continue this bloodline thing with it's the easiest thing to build in three weeks just say hey you know well, you got well, through solo's not solo's not fighting in these oh, have they have they announced who's yeah, the, the the six people. So it's it's Bobby Lashley versus LA Knight versus Santos Escobar, and then the other one is uh, Kevin Owens versus AJ Styles versus Rey Mysterio. So with that context, I'm going to guess the winner of the latter triple threat is the one that ultimately goes on. But I'm going to then say it's probably um, Bobby Lashley on the one side, either Kevin Owens or AJ Styles, I think you can get something good out of Kevin Owens because there's that built-in history of, I don't get here if I don't leave and you're the only person who took care of me on my way out the door and introduced me to the Young Bucks that, hey, treat him like you would treat me. So I think Kevin Owens is a good shot. I think AJ Styles is a good shot. I'd be very disappointed if it was LA Knight, but Bobby Lashley is always... Um, a solid challenger. Ray would be fun, right? But like, I don't see that being the case. And Santos hasn't built himself up to that level yet. So yeah, my my overall guess is going to be either Kevin Owens or J Styles goes all the way. I think, man, I'm trying so hard to mute this right when these stupid drills are not as loud as they are i'm sorry everybody it's either this or no hot tags this week because they started right when we were starting the record i was out of the conversation for like 10 minutes you're fine (laughs) well i mean we'll see in the comments if people are like yeah i'd rather uh, not hear this drill um blame uh the people above me they are loud as all hell constantly and uh i I wish i could put their names out there and put them on blast (laughs) but Um, I think that the very least likely option out of all this is Santos Escobar. I'd be extremely shocked if he wins this match and then beats the person of the other triple threat next week. But, you know, we've had Jinder Mahal beat Randy Orton for the title, so who knows? Yeah, the, uh, Callum said that it's, it feels very Daniel Bryan-y, and I feel like this make the make it feel very Kofi Kingston-y. If it's just like, hey, look, Santos Escobar gets a title shot now. It's like Dolph Ziggler gets a title shot just because, hey, Kofi Kingston's champion now. This is what they always do when the babyface wins the title at WrestleMania. Like, as soon as, soon as that... They it's take, the, like, the, a couple the, feuds before they start getting into, like, the actual... Well, the, few, the first feud's always underwhelming between somebody who doesn't really feel at that level and someone who's obviously not going to beat Cody Rhodes for the title. It's, it feels so much like... Between that and the fact that it's going to be Jay Uso versus Damian Priest for the other world championship, that's these feel at least the other one has Cody in, so that's good, and that obviously elevates it. And if it's against AJ, AJ has got Cache, and so does Kevin Owens and Bobby Lashley to extend. And then Ella Knight just won at WrestleMania, so you can kind of parlay it into that. But um, but the other one feels like such a mid card title match. So historically, the fallback guy for uh, Seth Rollins was AJ Styles. And the fallback guy for Kofi Kingston was Kevin Owens. 
So you do have both of those elements here. And I, I think you could just say, hey, let's just keep going with that. We do have a problem now of, hey, listen, I know that nobody's going to match the star power of Roman Reigns overnight. But it's a matter of, and I don't want to do the WWE thing of pinning it on fans to stick with the follow through, but they also need to now make you invest in the follow through. And I was thinking about this myself. I wish one of the questions asked by media to Paul Levesque on either night one or night two is, hey, Roman's, I guess it would have to be night two. Roman's out, Brock's out. You know, this is the first chance you had in a good decade or so to solidly say, we are moving away from the part-time performer concept and just running hard with the roster you have. I think to put it on anyone that isn't, you know, AJ or KO and try to keep the momentum going for Cody would be a great disservice to fans and to Cody. There's also the element that not only is the draft a factor I mentioned about like the whole, you have to kind of rush something um, and you know, it might play into who is like on the opposite roster or who's in the same roster and all that. But there's kind of an expectation that it's like, all right, we all know that Cody's not going to drop this title right now. So in their minds, I guess they're trying to do like a risk assessment of, do we go straight to another big feud and then maybe have like a lull, like do we start off with a, a peak and then go into a valley, or do we start off with the valley and start building up to bigger and better things? And they might just kind of be looking at this going, eh, you know what, backlash, it's it's selling well already without that. Let's do this, rush it out of the way, and before long we're at King and Queen in the ring, and then we can do something more important for the Saudi people and you know some other kind of big setup and you know i mean that, that also could just be that they plan on having nothing necessarily big there for that either because they're gonna have the king and queen of the ring tournaments but that I, even but, like that even i think factors into who wins this too because i think whoever ends up fighting cody here you can kind of rule that person out as being king of the ring and i mean you don't necessarily well, have Gunther's to Gunther's gonna be the king of the ring i kind of am leaning towards gunther yeah it seems like that would be a good way to like give him something to do in the meantime as before as Bash of Berlin. Yeah, <laughs> I, I, I'm so worried that they're going to make him King Gunter, and that's going to, I think that's going to, uh, like, affect his mistake. Here, okay, so, so my only hope, and I, I haven't put too much stock into the, it's the Paul Levesque era, but my only hope is this. Hunter went out of his way to, to destroy a crown and a scepter several times in order to avoid wearing crown and scepter. I don't think he's going to make someone else wear crown and scepter if they choose not to. <laughs> Is there like a, a ring general uh, equivalent of that that they could do for good there instead? I would hope that, I, that, would, <laughs> that might be worse. <laughs> <laughs> as long as they don't go with Kofi Kingston or Carrying Cross. <laughs> We've established that before. Safe. <laughs> um yeah so i mean we got that stuff coming up a little bit in smackdown tonight uh there's of course rumor and speculation that tama tonga is going to be on smackdown tonight so maybe we get to see him do something with that, the bloodline or something that makes me just go oh god they're gonna go with aj and oh god they're gonna go with bullet club i would rather the kevin owens story for three weeks about the young bucks than go with bullet club again I, I, I'm kind of good on the Bullet Club rehashings. So you're thinking Tomatonga is getting thrown in with Styles, and that's why they separated the Good Brothers? If, or do you think I'm they're going to put they the Good go Brothers with, back? I'm saying if they go with... If Tomatonga shows up and he happens to help AJ win, I'm just worried. I would rather not a Bullet Club story. You know? Yeah. I guess we're going to find out tonight. And... Um, let's toss around you thought on what they might do with Bailey? I, I know, think I the th this sounds kind of dismissive, but I think that their big grand scheme of Bailey tonight, and I hope I'm wrong about this, is she cuts a promo about how 
glad she is that she won the titles. And then Damage Control comes out mad, and we see Bianca, Naomi, and Jade, and uh, Bailey all like kind of fight them. And then it's like maybe a, an eight woman tag set up either for later on in the night or for next week. And it's just sort of like let's linger a little bit because I think that they're probably just going to do EO in a rematch. That's okay. It was a great match. I'd, I'd be all right with that. Now, that's not the only thing that's happening WWE related. There are two other things that I have written down before we get into AEW uh, stuff. Um, two like quicker kind of things. Um, one is we've gotten more teases of Uncle Howdy on uh, Monday Night Raw when they were like in the, the live uh, crowd. Got to have like this little song kind of cut in between. It seems like that maybe tied into this tweet that wwe had posted where it's just hello 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 a bunch of times and then they immediately deleted it doesn't necessarily have to mean that it's his uncle howdy well, no have that's to mean- that's the that's the lean in more than anything else because there was also the glitch during the bronson reed promo where the screen flashed for about a millisecond and just said the word hello yeah so i mean they could like repackage it. It might not necessarily be like, we're going with the uncle howdy character. We might go with like a different variation or something, or maybe it is setting up something else or whatever, but um, they have been doing more of these things lately. So it does sign the point towards that. At least I don't know if I'm pro or con that until I at least get to see like what, where they're going. I don't like the uncle howdy character. I'll say that. So if the whole plan is to just have Bo Dallas come out as uncle howdy, the way that we've been seeing him with that pitch black match, I don't think I'm going to be super high on that, but yeah, I'm willing to be proven wrong or, you know, have some alternative idea out there. I still haven't seen the documentary though. You should. It's very much. Um, I haven't, I'm not fully into the idea of let's just do Uncle Howdy because that was so tied into Bray and whatever vision that was. And I don't know how you get back on track with that. I'd rather Bo take elements and do a new idea. But also the argument can be made that we didn't see enough of Uncle Howdy to even know what the elements of that would have been. Bobby Lashley did beat him up, though, so I'd, if he is going to come back, I'd like him to be the uh, Bobby Lashley for, you know, embarrassing the character, what, three weeks in or whatever. I would kind of lean towards maybe I'd like to see Bo be just Bo and not have to do, like, a Bray Wyatt-esque gimmick, but... Well, I'd, I, I wouldn't want to see him do the... Not the Bo Leave thing, necessarily, yeah, like, but maybe that. just be, like, Bo Dallas and just kind of be... Yeah, here I am. I'm a guy. Like, uh, you know, when he was in NXT originally or something. And that's a little bland yeah, of a character. Yeah, yeah no, yeah, no. He, that's, that's, that's what the entire crowd like, turned on him. This is when I would say you do need to watch the documentary. You do need to understand how important it was that they were doing those kind of characters. He talks about, like, him being invested in that kind of a character, too? Yeah, being oh, okay. invested in playing the, a monster alongside hmm. his brother. So you're getting that element of a character. I would just rather it not be directly Uncle Howdy, unless he yeah, is so deep in thought on what that character was going to be. Yeah, I mean, maybe they have some really good plans. Uh, I'm willing to see what they do with it at the very least. I'm not going to like entirely write it off, but yeah, you know, my history with Bray Wyatt's character stuff is... <laughs> It's a different era too. Like maybe we would have gotten something better if Vince wouldn't have been in the mix, and maybe that's what been uh, would have been screwing us all up in the meantime. But um, I guess we're gonna find out more when we find out. They don't really have any kind of confirmation of that stuff yet. I you know we, I don't expect this to factor into the Cody Rhodes triple threat thing or anything like that. Um, I do. I, I could see uh, Bo versus Cody down the line. Bo needs to come in as a baby face. Yeah. He has to be, because... He's, he's going to get cheered. Come, it, well, yeah, and he's coming in as a... Well, a tribute act to Bray Wyatt. As a, as, a, as a tribute act to his dead brother. Yeah. So, so yeah, he's he's got to be a baby face coming in. 
even if that wasn't the ambition or the plan, and if that means the tweaking of even the uncrowded character, where the character he's going to be portraying, he needs to be a baby face at least initially. I think he needs to be a baby face for a while, really, because the crowd aren't going to give him a heel re- reaction until afterwards, unless he, well, I imagine they won't go down this route, but after like the, I'm, uh, I don't know why I'm linking this in particular, but like the Candice LeRae thing with Maxine Dupree just bringing up the dead brother for yeah. like no reason whatsoever, just to get heel heat on Candice. Maybe like the only other way they'd go down that route is if he's not coming as a tribute to him, but as a kind of to, you know, oh my God, like, can you take over the memory of like that. Staying oh, on oh, the yeah, legacy it, or something. Yeah, and, yeah. And, he, and, and and that would get him mega heat, but I'd argue that's probably not the right t- type of heat that they want, especially right wow. now when they're in the when they're in the ascendancy in terms of the uh, the uh, I guess the, um, the viewpoint perception of the wars, but their yeah, perception yeah. wars right now. Great term. <laughs> so let's uh, pivot. Oh, actually, uh, before we pivot over to NXT, shout out to whoever just bought another T-shirt of "I Suffer from Wrestling Bitch Face." <laughs> I just got the notification about that. As uh, that it. wasn't more of a thing. I still think that that should sell more. Um, so thank you to whoever bought that. that one in particular, and I bet you got some. Thanks. That's been up on the shop for a while now, and I somebody uh, you know, picked up one of it the other day and picked up another one today so cool uh thank you for the support that's a an extra what, two dollars or something that i get <laughs> it's not much but hey everything a little bit counts so thank you for that um let's switch over to some nxt talk right now and uh i'm trying to do a little uh something here with um i know people have been always requesting time codes i'm trying to keep track of the time codes now as we're going along here so nxt related content there's some stuff throughout this week that they did that kind of pushed some new stories forward. I, I liked um, a good amount of what NXT was this week. Not, you know, some of it, some of it was kind of blah, but um, they settled on the Chase University debt story. And I think they did it in a rather decent way on the grand Yeah, screen. I was very surprised at how, <laughs> how a, a story that the, like was really just like this, this is stupid and all. <laughs> Uh, their rationale is uh, JC Jane reveals that they got into debt because Andre Chase put a big bet on Thea Hale winning the championship and the one that he threw the towel in and he prioritized her health and like her safety over the money. So now Thea Hale's next story is she feels like it's all her fault. And I'm like, you know, that's a good enough transition for me. I like that. Although I would say Andre Chase is a fucking moron. Yeah. I mean, if you bet all the money and you believe in your student, you Fucking let them win the match. Yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, you could then believe that she can get out of that hold and, you know. Yeah. Like, um, I don't I remember who. I, I don't want to even give the guy credit. Uh, some jackass saw the Javon Evans match and started, like, calling him a slave or something on Twitter. It what? became a thing. Yeah. It's like, uh, fuck off, whoever you are. Jesus Christ. I, I am so glad. I, I don't know how I do it but i'm so glad i don't pay attention to the bulk of wrestling twitter when i hear shit like that that's disgusting yeah and some racist asshole uh which is like the you know the real story is javon evans looks fucking fun i like his debut that was cool yeah he's gonna be great uh natty had a match with roxanne roxanne retained it was this whole thing with tatum turning on lyra this is messy. I don't like any of this. I don't like, I don't really care to see Lola Vice versus Natty going forward. And they're kind of throwing a bunch of people in together, but it's not really doing much for me in the grand scheme. I like that her idol pose is just constantly, you know, fanning herself or, you know, shaking her ass. Like, for some reason, she can't. Uh, Lola Vice cannot stand still. She's just no, like she's like a create a character moving. select screen or something. Yeah, she's just perpetually moving. It's very fun to me. She's very over the top. In some ways, it's fun, and some other ways, it's like wow, this is like maybe tone it down a little bit. You're you're getting uh, silly with it. Uh, 
Speaking of silly, Rich Holland wanted to apologize to Joe Gacy for hitting him with the chair. Joe Gacy's like, ah, it's fine. I get it. You're totally nuts. And and that leads to <laughs> him slamming a door on Cruz del Toro's hand. Which was yeah. easily the most accidental thing he's done since starting this character. Yeah, like maybe, maybe start off with that instead of <laughs> start off with intentionally hitting somebody in the back with a chair that's done nothing to you. But uh, no Drew Gulak out with the no quarter catch crew. Oh, so, yeah, that's he is that real quick kind of sidelined right now with this whole ronda rousey thing because fightful reported that they pulled him from the hall of fame like they, they just pulled him from all the things they pulled his name from that titan tron if i had to guess i don't think we're seeing him for a while or ever yeah or ever, just be, yeah. You know, ever is very possible like i'm i'm hoping that there's a, a better silver lining to everything and all because i you know, outside of uh, what I don't know, of course, I like a Drew Gulak, so I'm hoping that there's nothing that's actually a grounds to be fired. But um, they're doing this whole thing again with a uh, metaphor and Ormensa and Die Jack and all this, and nothing's really like super all that great going on. But Obafemi, outside of probably going to beat the shit out of or uh, Mensa soon, is going to be fighting Ivar soon. And I'm like, all right. I'm down to see Obafemi versus Ivar. That could be kind yeah, of fun. It felt like a very big, hey, if you're not doing anything with them, just send them back to NXT week mm-hmm. on NXT. Yeah, for the most part. A couple different people doing that. And then, of course, you know, somebody leaving because Axiom and Nathan Fraser won the NXT tag titles from the Wolf Dogs. Broad Breaker cut a promo afterward about leaving NXT, thanking Baron Corbin, thanking Shawn Michaels, the NXT crowd, you know, everything along those lines, which I wonder why they didn't just go with the tag title switching hands at the pay-per-view. Just to drag it out, just to have something for TV. Which I'm not out. a fan of. <laughs> no. <laughs> um, no, nah, I wasn't a fan of that. Because suddenly it was like, we can do it, we can beat them. And I never got the vibe that like it was that serious. You know? Or that they really could or should. <laughs> yeah, it was very strange. But yeah, it's uh, shout out to them, uh, the Supersonic Duo. Yeah, the Supersonic Duo. That's their name, which is um very campy, and yeah, I kind of like it. The more the times pass by, it's very like uh, Batman and Robin ish. I'd rather I'd rather give everybody a name than have them to be Axiom and Nathan Frazier. Yeah, but if you're gonna give them a name. And like not say it, it's almost like you're not giving them a name, period. Because they're not going to build them as the supersonic duo. They're just going to have on the um, screen Axiom and Nathan Fraser. Um, we do know at least the title situation too for Ilya Dragunov. Trick Williams Dragon, uh, <laughs> Dragon, uh, challenge to Dragunov to a match that's going to happen at Spring Break In, which is going to be a two night affair the way that they've done a few of these other things over the past it seems like they're kind of testing out the idea of that like with the gold rush and all and dragonov agreed under the stipulation that if trick loses he has to leave nxt and then immediately after that carmelo he's tacked trick setting up that they're gonna have a steel cage match next week which supposedly was something that they were thinking about doing for the pay-per-view so it's two things for the pay-per-view that they decided let's hold off and let's do that on tv instead and I'm assuming whether Hayes wins the steel cage match or not, Trick is going to end up beating Dragunov. How about you guys? Um, very interesting that any one of these three men could end up on the main roster. It would make perfect sense. Trick seems the most likely to stay and have a run as NXT champion, but he does have a certain quality about him that I can see him skipping the line a little bit. I'm going to guess Trick beats both Mello in the cage and Dragunov at Spring break but I wouldn't be surprised to see Dragunov be the one to stay and Mello and Trick go up. Spring break is happening before the draft, but it is happening like right before the draft. It is um, the 20. 20- Wait, is it the 23rd and the 30th? Or is it the 16th and the 23rd? No, it's not next week. Uh, wait, now I'm blanking on uh, the actual specifics about that. Let me double check on the handy dandy smart out moment pay-per-view schedule page because that is update with everything. We'll talk about the AEW stuff going forward too. 
So NXT Spring Breaking is the 23rd and the 30th. And the draft is scheduled for uh, right before Backlash. Uh, May 4th, of course, is Backlash. So um, it's going to be in between the two, funny enough. I don't know how that's going to play into maybe they just do the Dragunov match on the 23rd. He gets drafted either on the 26th or the 29th and we move completely on after that. Or if they wait until the 30th and they do that and it's like, oh, NXT champion Ilya Dragunov or, you know, if they go in another direction gets drafted to Raw or SmackDown, then they just kind of spoil what ends up happening with that. Because <laughs> obviously if Dragunov comes up to the roster and he's holding that championship, he's losing it. Um, the draft thing is very interesting when they book around it. So keep an eye out on all that, everyone. And uh, that's all the NXT stuff that I got this week before we get into oh, AEW. Hold on. Because they're irrelevant, but the Final Testament are also in NXT now. Oh, that's right. Yeah, they they had attacked uh, the Wolf. No, not the Wolf Dogs. Uh, Axiom and Nathan Fraser. So what a great couple of weeks for <laughs> the Final Testament, They're going right? to be better off in NXT, and I... I, I still like the group. I still think the group has potential. But you forgetting to even mention it when it was the closing angle of the show tells you everything you need to know about how this landed. It's not the best. <laughs> there's There's been worse. There's been better. Um, AEW stuff, though. Let's start getting into that. We've got a couple different topics to talk about. We've got the... Uh, let's go in this uh, trademark side of things. Um Chris Jericho has trademarked another few things where, you know, Jericho is like the most trademark happy guy that's out there, but he tends to use them at least for like a little bit of time. Yeah. You know what's coming when he does this shit. And the three that he has trademarked this time around are the rarefied air of Jericho air as in like what you breathe, not in like uh, an air to the throne, the educator and the learning tree. And before we got started recording, we were just kind of talking about like running down some hot tag topics and stuff. Uh, we are all in agreement here. The learning tree is just going to be the name of a group and he is going to call himself the educator. And this is going to be another Jericho appreciation society. <laughs> and I can't say that I'm the most thrilled about it, to be honest. With maybe Jericho less of appreciation a society, just like, tanked i i don't understand why they did that i don't think it tanked i think it, they sat on it too long i i've genuinely enjoyed jericho in a group in AEW more than i've enjoyed him floating around on his own for the past several months that has not been good Float if, around, he's gonna insist man. On, if he's gonna insist on being on tv i have more faith in the learning tree than him trying to be a baby face lion heart guy because that's not working yeah it looks like he's uh, about to start dabbling in teaching so <laughs> um i mean I, I i've said over the last couple of months that jericho just needs to go off tv like he he's been over exposed for way too long there's other people in aew that could utilize that tv time a lot better and yeah, he needs he's he's not playing the game correctly where you're an age wrestler who does have a lot of cachet and can still go to a certain degree, should be taking time like periodic like three month, four month breaks and then come back in, get a bit of a pop and then get a bit of momentum behind you. It's the whole Kogan strategy. That's what he did to uh continue his momentum for as long as he did. So I think that Jericho stuck around too long and it's gone stale and he's already very much disliked by a, a, a portion of the AEW audience. And so, I don't know, this will just be another heel group and maybe it will help introduce some other people, but it's not like anybody that's been in a faction with Jericho in the past has really been elevated off the back of it. I guess uh, Daniel Garcia is the best like example of someone who kind of has, but probably hasn't to the extent that he could have been. Until a few months, like I told that a month ago, I would have said, uh, Menard and Parker would be a great example because they were legit nothing, but they seemingly fell back down. So can't say 
that they're a good example. I think the only way to do this, if it is a faction, is to do an entire group of young people, like, and try to almost like the anti BCC or what the BCC was originally pitched as. I think if it was going to be like a Jericho, if this is going to be like a Jericho learning tree, and he's going to be like essentially the head trainer or teacher of all these people, then I think whoever they bring in to be part of this group need to just wrestle using Chris Jericho's moveset. Oh, that'd be fun. Because that would yeah, actually I think be interesting. Because like if you if whether it's new people, whether it's some other people in the AW roster that haven't been doing too much. They should just be start doing maybe not initially, but like as the weeks go on and they're part of this group, they should just be starting to do Jericho's moves. Like all of them should be hitting lion salts, all of them should be putting people in the walls of Jericho, hitting the code breaker or the Judas effect and all this other stuff. Like that should just be that should be the gimmick, is that it's literally Jericho and three or four mini Jerichos. Or at, at the very least, I like this idea. Since he has so many finishing moves, maybe he can like, and you, you're, you know, agile. So I gift you the lion salt. Now you win all your matches with that and you can do the balls of Jericho because you're a submission guy. I think that'd be a lot of fun. I'd be way more interested in that idea than if it's just, here are a couple people that I think I could pay a little bit of attention to like hook and whoever else. I don't know. And yeah, Callum they just, just sold me on this actually. And they just like hang around me and they get the rarefied air of Jericho and they breathe it in and you know, that's it. Okay, oh, that's, so, that's, that, oh, that's the line. That's the line, isn't it? Breathe like, it in, like, man. Yeah. Yeah, breathe it in, man. Yeah, that's gonna be Well no, I, I genuinely just think that they're bringing in Richard Holiday and that they're already just biting his rarefied air gimmick to bring in Richard Holiday to AEW. But I could be wrong. Maybe maybe Jericho's just gonna breathe it in, man. But it would be Jericho's line, surely, because if it's like the rarefied air of Jericho, does that mean the only other way that would be is like the case that they would just be a tag team? That'd be a Richard Holiday and Chris Jericho tag team, the rarefied air of Jericho. That's true. So I I I, I say I don't know whether this guy's coming in or not, but it's just a case of we know we know what direction it's going. It's going to be Jericho's third faction in AEW. They'll be the head of. Um, maybe the first one that really works. So that's something to pay attention to. Another thing to pay attention to, uh, by proxy of, I guess, not uh, having that in uh, in AEW, is that Matt Hardy is a free agent. And in the same kind of range, we know that uh, Brian Cage is not, <laughs> and that Hook is, at least uh, according to the rumor and speculation, and, in, uh, you know, kind of rumor mill type stuff possibly going to explore some other options after his contract is over although i don't really trust in that whatsoever i think that that's just kind of you know the same lip service that you get with like uh randy orton saying that no oh, i could go to AEW, and it's like yeah you're not planning to i would yeah, but be, randy orton's not 23 no but i think that <laughs> most people are gonna say that they yeah, i'd like to explore the other stuff and then they end up going to the place that we expected them to go and i don't think hook's leaving at all uh i think that matt hardy very much wants to go back to wwe and all signs kind of point to that even like rebby you know, is constantly like tagging wwe and things and stuff uh i kind of can't see them really putting much effort into signing them though um because it's got to be a package deal and i don't know if they really want to go through the headache of matt jeff hardy anymore so maybe a legends deal or something but i think we're gonna see matt hardy just elsewhere until maybe they do agree to do some kind of like legends contract or something and i think hook's gonna stay where he is where do you guys think these guys are gonna land i think hook leaves and i think matt hardy will probably go to wwe i'm sure he's sitting on it because he wants to go with Jeff, but Jeff is still very much in a contract. But I think, I think unless he's like, Hey Tony, we want to be on your TV and not just in random matches losing. I think he's going to go even, you know, honestly, even TNA, I think Matt Hardy's going to go wherever somebody wants to go. Yes, you are great. 
and here's all this TV time. Not you know, and that's fine. That's the wrestler way, but I don't know. I was kind of heartbroken by the Hardys in AEW, so I can't say I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, I think Matt might take on like some kind of producer role in WWE, or um. Yeah, I mean, to be to, to honest, like it's, it's it doesn't really bother me where he ends up going as long as he's not back in AEW. Um, Hook could go to WWE. I think that like he's a young guy and that he might see more potential with so many aging names in WWE to move up the ladder if he can if he moves to WWE. And Taz has already said in my like, interviews that he wants Hook to go to WWE at some point. So, but. Uh, that's kind of like a wait and see approach. I think that essentially him announcing that he's going to, well, that the reports going around that he's going to explore free agency, I pretty much would just apply that to basically every wrestler nowadays. Like all of them should be exploring the possibility of free agency and exploring other options. They shouldn't just be tied into the one company they're going to be at because it freshens up both their character and it gives them an opportunity to, you know, potentially make more money elsewhere whether that's going from AEW to WWE or WWE to AEW. Like, I don't think people should be... I don't, I, I, in this kind of, like, era where we've got these two big promotions competing and a lot of other small promotions around side, I don't think people should really be staying in promotions more than, like, five, six years, really. Because by that point, you get stale. Outside of, like, a few really top, top names. I am leaning more with uh with hook that like my gut would say for a lot of people that i would want them in wwe just because i am more of a wwe fan but i kind of feel like it might be a better idea if he stays in aew because he's he's being pushed rather well and he's young enough that i think if he went one way or another, I, I think he's probably in a good spot, and I'm pretty sure that WWE would be welcoming him in open arms and all. But part of me just kind of thinks that maybe he should stay. If he comes to like an NXT or something, though, I'm totally on board for that. I just uh, don't have the same enthusiasm when it comes to Matt Hardy. I if he stays in AEW, it's it's not good. Everything in AEW has not been good for the Hardys. <laughs> and then if he goes to TNA, that's not going to make me want to watch it. And if he goes to WWE, I'm mostly going to be like, all right, well, well what do we do with him? And if he goes to WWE, it's the best option because he's a player coach. And then he can get a couple more matches in, but mostly just be producing. You know, I think that's probably the safest long term bet for him. It just really depends on how much he feels like, no, no, we still have legs as performers. Depending on how much uh, legs they do have, is uh, you know we've seen what the Hardy Boys what that means. Um, we're talking about talking long term. Let's talk about these pay per views coming up for AEW because we do have the remaining pay per view schedule unless something changes. You know they've already had a change in announcing this for the rest of the year, and that does not include the ROH pay per views, the you know, uh, final battle and um, Death Before Dishonor and. Uh, that's okay, what's the other one? Them. What is the other one? We'll see if we've got one that they just had, yeah. No, the other one that, that would be... Is, is they, they only have, they only, no, they only have just three. three. Yeah. Oh, it does, I'm, I'm th- blanking on... Um, the. I'm thinking of the other thing as I'm lo- looping in there, like um, Holiday Bash and uh, Winter's Coming and, oh, and no, all yeah, those. Oh, no, that's TV um, specials. Yeah. No, I'm, uh, they're blending in together with like blood and guts and stuff for me. Um, we don't know about those. They're TV specials, so they don't really count. But the pay-per-views themselves, we know, of course, Double or Nothing has already been like pretty much established beforehand. Forbidden Door has been changed, though. It is not going to be at Arthur Ashe Stadium anymore. It is instead going to be at the UBS Arena in Elmont, New York, which I have never heard of. It's just Long Island. Elmont, New York. It's, it's one of those things that's like... Long Island. <laughs> It's the type of funny thing where it's like, yeah, technically speaking, All Out is happening at the Now Arena in Hoffman Estates, Illinois. And everybody's like, yeah, it's, it's Chicago. Um, uh, so I don't know if I am as interested to go. I was considering possibly going um, to the Arthur Ashe one. But uh, maybe I'll, I'll look into seeing how yeah, that's about. Yeah, I was about. far more interested in Arthur Ashe than I am in the uh, 
taking the UBS arena and then going to Long Island, but also primarily going into the city to stay with you. So like I'm <laughs> far less interested in that, but still maybe the card is insane. You know, like yeah. maybe the card is too good to pass up. Could be. And we know like, you know, if you want to go and see like the actual, all the dates and, you know, the, Full gear is at the Prudential Center in Newark at November 23rd, like that kind of thing. Go ahead and check out the website. Uh, as just as far as knowing this information, it's good to know because now that made me able to switch around some of the stuff in the uh, calendar for this whole, you know, trying to plan out smart count moment, trying to plan out some uh, articles to do in the future. I had to adjust like, hey, I had planned on the around June 29th or so for us to do a fan ounce table of uh money in the bank ladder match that we normally do all right we're gonna have to move that to the week beforehand in between cash the castle and forbidden door and you know i wish that wwe would do this because it makes it so much easier for me but it seems like the main reason for this could be that they want to put it out there so people can prepare for travel ahead of time and you know look at that logic (laughs) <laughs> of uh i think hey. it's that and i think you're also preparing the home viewer yes we are doing this amount of pay-per-views regularly moving forward yeah like just this is our go-to we're gonna have every year russell dream every year full gear world's end of course i'm not a big fan of world's end being around december 28th like it is because then that cuts into the end of the year awards and you know so there is a part of me that's thinking maybe for the first time we switch it up a little bit maybe we do instead of one to watch at the beginning of January, maybe that's when we do our end of the year awards. I don't know. Um, We have months to figure that out, thankfully. Although every time I turn around, it's like a month and a half goes by. So uh, I don't think there's really too much to stand out here as far as like, you know, Hey, Russell dreams happening in Tacoma. Okay. You know, (laughs) Well, the, the thing that stands out about that is probably where Danielson wraps it up. I think that that's where he calls it quits. Yeah, because Washington. And he had said he wanted to at least get back there. So I'm guessing that's where he calls it quits. I mean, that is a good point. That's going to be after Wembley. And it's going to be later on in this year. So he'll have had some feuds with some other people in the meantime. And yeah, maybe that's like the big headlining thing for that is the last of his like big run on that. I guess we're going to have to stay tuned for that. Um, any other thoughts about the pay-per-view stuff before we get into our headliner of our uh, hot tags? Uh, I don't think so. Yeah, it's, 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 just, it's just dates when they're going to be coming, coming out, really. So there's nothing too special to it. Do you wish that there were more, like, dynamites in your neck of the woods, Callum? Like, do you wish that they were just doing TV in the UK? Oh, yeah. Because I'd, I'd go to them if they were, but like I understand that that's not gonna happen. That's not that's not realistic. All right. So let's talk about the big one. <laughs> um, Dynamite this week, of course, had other things that that happened on it, and um, you know some of the stuff is like uh, worth going back and checking out. Some of the stuff is as inconsequential as it is on like raw and yeah, NXT and all um, no like uh, title changes, but we do have, um, you know, we had uh, the Samoan Joe champion <laughs> beating Dustin Rhodes. <laughs> I still think that that's funny that they ended up following up like that. Uh, Adam Copeland beat Penta to retain his uh, TNT title. We got the confirmation of the continental championship match for dynasty that we'll talk about next week. Um, with a uh, Kazuchika Okada and Pack, Ryan May beat Anna J. Shane Taylor Promotions beat Lion Hook and um, Katsuyori Shibata. But of course, the big thing that people are talking about, and you know, that Mina Shirakawa kissed Mariah May. Exactly, after her match. it was amazing. It was people a good cheated. decision to <laughs> film that and to air that. It got great. Uh, was definitely <laughs> present for it. It got a great response on Twitter, and all was well in the world. <laughs> Good night, everybody. Yeah. Uh, well, if you want to check out the, <laughs> no. 
Um, AW All In footage was shown. Uh, we had known that this was going to be a thing heading into this. It was advertised in advance because they wanted to pop the rating, and they did. They got you know a ratings boost in that front. I don't know why it's necessarily something to super super celebrate because there has been pretty much universal backlash to this and they are taking down all the footage on, you know, if anybody tries to repost this on X or anything, I have seen very few reactions that are in any kind of like positive way. Cause it's like the most positive reactions that I see are, Oh, CM Punk's a dick. And it's like, well, yeah, everybody agrees. That hasn't changed at all. Everybody knows that that's the case. And it seems like this was just a bad call. Uh, Tony Schiavone looked like he was just like, I've seen this crap before. A lot of people posting memes of like, um, you know, uh, this time around, he didn't have to say the whole, this was butts and seats type thing and all. Uh, they are they've re re aired that without the footage and just like the young bucks um portion of it which i don't think does anything good either and they're trying to repurpose this into a means to push ftr and like hey they're in part responsible and it's an asterisk that they had beaten us and that we are gonna you know overtake that and beat them at dynasty and win those belts and all i don't think this was the right strategy at all I don't think that anybody comes out of this looking good. I don't think anybody comes out of this looking bad that they intended to like punk doesn't look that much worse. A lot of people are like very pro punk from this for different reasons. Some of them I don't quite understand because a lot of people are like, Oh, I would have kicked his ass too and whatever. And I never really condone just, you know, punching somebody or, you know, to me, I've always thought like if you're having an argument and you resort to having to do like a physical violence thing, it's kind of Neanderthalish. Like you're, you're just sort of you and I disagree on logic and opinion. So if I punch you hard enough, you will agree with me. It doesn't make sense. I'm not pro punk in this scenario for most of it, but I do understand the arguments people make when they say. Hey, if you have somebody in your face and they're, you know, they're kind of calling for it, sometimes you, you got to do what you got to do. And I got, I understand people saying things like, um, no matter what, if you strike somebody, you deserve to be fired. I don't think anybody's actually even arguing against the idea of punk being fired. It just seems like it's very much, this looks bad for AEW and it looks bad for Tony Khan to have put this out there and I don't know. It kind of comes across a little bit to me like a, a kid whining and being like, not like the tattletale type thing, but like, I just don't know what they thought this was going to do. Cause this doesn't make me want to watch dynasty more. I'll say that. So I okay, guess so I'll talk about my perspective on it. So, I mean, I've got conflicted thoughts. I mean, the overall fall is this was a bad decision. And Tony Khan has kind of let... I, I think AEW for a long time has tried to play the the bigger person in this quote-unquote war with WWE in that essentially Punk has been given kind of carte blanche to say whatever he wants, really, about this whole situation. And they had the Ariel Hawani interview, which everyone kind of, like... I mean, Tony in particular, like the head saying, like, oh, I, I appreciate the um, the candor and the honesty of which he's played, but it's like, but that's him being petty. He's not no longer part of that company. Why is he talking about that shit? But so, so basically, Tony Khan probably took the response of, well, if he's going to talk about it, then I'm just going to do what I can, which is I've got a whole TV show and I can broadcast the actual footage of what happened. And, you know, that's just a case of pettiness going way too overboard and but what i would have done just now in reflection of it is that if i was tony khan i would have just leaked the footage to the press and just like said hey here's what actually here's the actual footage put it out on whatever network you want to put it out on or put it out on your news channels or whatever 
and just and just leave it there because then rather than take up valuable TV time, which could have been utilised in another way, rather than just to air out this dirty laundry, which we need to just be moving past. But nobody involved in this seems willing to move to just forget this ever happened and just or just like just or accept that it happened and just move on from it. Yeah, it seems like the only people that are saying that are the ones that weren't directly involved. Like FTR had that promo afterward where they're like, oh my God, let's move on from this. Yeah, well, that's what we want. That's I think that's what pretty most most fans just want to, you know, that thing happened. That was a moment in time. That was a crazy occurrence. And I say in the immediacy following it, then you're going to be talking about it. But it's been fucking eight months since that happened. Can we fucking move on at this point and just forget about it? Punk's in a WWE and he's seemingly happy with what he's doing there. AEW has been performing in terms of like the quality of their shows has been much better since Punk left. So let's all just be happy about that and move on. But no, they keep relegating the stuff, whether it's Punk saying the stuff in the interview, whether that... And to be fair, Hawani was smart to get all that stuff out of him, but Punk didn't take a political approach. He decided to just air it all out and sat, pissed off Tony Khan, and so he decided to air that stuff out as well and to the detriment of his own program. So that's that's the overall fault, is that the whole... Uh, the whole usage of this was just, you know, a heat of the moment thing, which no one seems to be able to talk Tony Khan out of doing. And so he's done it. He probably regrets it. And now we can just hopefully move on from it and try and forget this ever happened. But now probably Punk is going to have a response or WWE is going to have a response to it. And then we'll just keep going and going till the end of time. But um, in terms of the footage itself, it was quite a fa- fascinating as just footage to watch. Yeah. And uh, there wasn't much to it. In terms of the fact that I know everyone is bringing up the whole like line about Tony Khan saying that he feared for his life, which is you know it's one of those things that I think he said at the time to kind of babyface himself or babyface or try and villainize Punk a little bit. And but I can kind of understand that if there's a guy in front of you who's just seemingly attacked a guy unprovoked in front of you and is just like banging into the tables and monitors in front of you, then I would say like, I'd fear for my life, but I'd probably fear for my safety and well-being. It's like, especially if he's then turning to you and then just screaming at you saying, fuck you, I quit, this place is a joke. Then, so maybe it's just a wrong choice of words. But the whole footage, I think, I think the main points we can take away from it is uh, Jack Perry did nothing to instigate that. Punk is the absolute aggressor. Punk comes in on his own, gets in Perry's face. Perry's from the food seat. He might say the phrase. He probably does say the phrase. What are you going to do about it? But he gives no indication that he's willing to fight Punk or is is expecting Punk to go after him. Like by the time that well, the moment that Punk first pushes him and gets him in the choke, uh, Perry's playing with his hair. So it's like he's completely unprepared for an attack. Punk goes after him completely aggressively gets him in the choke it's immediately broken up within five seconds by Samoa Joe and the referee I think was the referee who was the referee in that one it wasn't Bryce was it, it Paul was, Turner yeah Paul Turner yeah just getting in immediately and breaking it up uh Joe looks like a badass as we'd expect that's kind of like another thing you just take away a uh, hook in the corner looks like he can care less what was going on that was quite funny just like the <laughs> memes coming out of it outside of Chris Hero yeah are hook being a Sims NPC that is just standing <laughs> But that, that's kind of like it's the demonstration that Hook's gimmick is basically who Hook is. So that's kind of funny. <laughs> he's um, looking at that and he's going, hmm, I wonder if I'm going to go to NXT. <laughs> yeah. so, so there's some stuff that's like, I think for the most part, what Punk said is is fairly reflective of what happened outside of the fact that um, he didn't, I don't think he felt like he was challenged by Perry at all. I think that Perry may have said that phrase, but I think Punk was out of line. Like the fact that he said, like I think I, I thought I was being responsible in this situation. I just choked the guy a little bit. Like he was completely out of line with what he did. I think that that's fairly irrefutable based on the video. I know there are certain people that say on lines of, well, this sort of thing, this is just a scuffle that happened backstage. Like this could happen any time. But it's still, I think that it's still justifiable that Punk got fired yeah, based totally. on this, based on this, and also a history prior to that of other events that happened in the company. I think that it's yeah, so. So I'd say it hasn't changed what what's what the overall thing is, the case of all the people that sided 
before this with CM Punk had more reason have more reason to side with CM Punk coming out of it. All the people that hated CM Punk have more reasons and to hate CM Punk, but they still have the same opinions. And the people that were on the fence are still probably on the fence with that, the whole thing. Mm-hmm. So really, nobody's opinion got changed about mm-hmm. anything. So it hasn't had an side effect. The only thing they did have was that there were CM Punk chants in the arena afterwards, uh-huh. which, is, which is fucking, dumb, which is which is another fucking dumb thing about it. It also means that Jack Perry, who's going to be fighting in Chicago at Windy City Riot for New Japan Pro Wrestling, is going to get drowned with CM Punk chants on that show uh, because of what happened. I've one thing, and I, I've heard some people talk about, it, so I'm probably going to be echoing this, but that's the kind of the case of doing a podcast a couple of days after this stuff happens when other people have already gotten all their points across. But um, Jack Perry is really a scapegoat because he did not deserve to get suspended for this. He I did think, nothing. He, he did nothing wrong. I think. I oh. think that there's there's an argument that you, there might be grounds for suspension when you don't know what the audio is. Yeah, that's like Tony Khan angle... could hear what what Perry said to Punk. It, and when it, you don't I mean, like, you can't see if maybe there's like another element before or after that had happened or so like the footage of course looks like punk is just like making a lunge and and doing that so that if you're going by just the footage it kind of seems like he didn't do anything but then there might be more to the situation beyond that but i don't know if i would have suspended him for as long as he's been suspended either based off of this too and like he's been gone he's been gone for seven months yeah like i don't know if that's i i think i would have probably ended the suspension before that so i would have like potentially like fined him or suspended him slightly for a short period of time because of essentially the crimea river line which kind of instigated this and then if anything that he said behind the scenes but he did he did not like lay a hand on cm punk so i don't think that i say i don't think it's justifiable the uh, repercussions that he's faced since then, but he is coming back and he's going to have this new character associated with it and be aligned with the elite. So I guess in the long term, it might work out in Perry's favor in terms of his character and his position because that heel turn was beforehand was going absolutely nowhere. So, so okay, go ahead. I know, I'm, 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 you, you can go now. Well, just as you're saying that, I'm thinking to myself, they need to hook him back. I don't know if it's with Luchasaurus again, they need to hook him back up with a monster and have this fucking guy instigate shit with his mouth and then immediately like eh, eh, no, you can find Luchasaurus, the elite said so like that's the only way that you play this footage and you turn it into something for TV that it's kind of like okay this is kind of fun because I, 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 yeah, good. Uh, sorry don't know you Karen uh, it's like my uh, my overall thoughts are no, this isn't a company killer. At least <laughs> not yet. We don't know if history will have this be the moment where everybody goes back to. But no, this isn't an immediate company killer. Not immediate. This, like Definitely not immediate. This was the stupidest fucking thing this company has done so far. <laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah. Period. That's what it is. Um, to me, especially when the report came out from Meltzer that, oh, they're going to embarrass Punk, make him look like a liar. And I saw some people with the takes that, oh, Punk's recollection on Hawaii, Hawaii's podcast is totally thrown out the window. No, it's not. I read the quote. I wrote the quote, then read the quote again and again and again after watching it. He said, I walked up to him, asked him why he did that. He got. He said, what are you going to do about it? I said, come on, let's not do this. He said, you know, whatever he said, and I choked him. Granted. Should a 40-something-year-old <laughs> Bill Brooks be choking the son of Luke Perry? Probably not. But at the same time, hey, man, if you wouldn't let it go because you thought he wasn't going to do anything, eh, I don't know. Um, the, the fear for my life thing is as silly in retrospect already as Vince McMahon's time-honored tradition because it's bullshit both ways. Hey, look, I get it. Tony Khan's probably never been in this situation before. But to say you feared for your life, I, I don't know. It just it reads like hyperbole, but maybe he felt that way. Who are we to invalidate his feelings? Uh, I love the uh, I love the very political approach to this. Because it's like, I, it's what I feel like I'm doing here. I was hoping for 
for like legit like overacted Zapruder film narration of like, <laughs> and here we are, and it was, it was just dead air, and it was like the weirdest thing. <laughs> Kevin Costner pops up and he's like, <laughs> "You see right here that uh, punk hits him, back and Jack Perry goes back and to the left." <laughs> For some of that, but it was just like it was dead air. It's over in two seconds, mm-hmm. and the discourse on social media has driven me to my wit's end to the point where I just I do not care. That's my overall takeaway. From it. Like it, it hurt the vibe of AEW. I think they were doing just fine before this. I think they should have reconsidered. But what I want to happen is I want John Moxley to win this IWGP title, come back to Dynamite on Wednesday and say, Daddy's back. Why the fuck are you people doing this? I can't take two weeks off this show without you people going insane. That's what I would like to happen because it, it was legitimately, like I told Tony this, I had a hard time focusing on Dynamite after because it was just like, it just sucked the air out of the room. You know what I mean? Even at home. like It definitely didn't restore the feel. <laughs> It didn't no. restore the there you go. It didn't restore the feeling. I think I think that um I think that they did in terms of the story aspect of it with the whole Bucks talking about how um because of this it meant that they couldn't pray or get pre- in, in wrestler mode for their match of FTR and that's why they lost the match at all in. I think that was like the best they could have done in the situation in terms of trying to make it like bring it back to kayfabe. Except uh, for one thing, and I, I understand that it just it wasn't this way, but if you could have just, if there was some kind of clip of the Young Bucks heads being there, or like something where you can see that they conversed with Perry, then you're like, okay, cool. But, but I don't know. But, I, um, but I mean, it was like, it's one of the things, like, I think it was the best kind of thing they could do to try and bring it back in a situation where there was absolutely nothing they could do to bring it back. Yeah, so, like they were they were screwed. Like Yeah. But but I think that as I say, I think that they needed to be smarter in the way that they approached this after because I I mean fundamentally I have no problem with AEW snapping back at WWE on occasion because yeah. especially after WrestleMania weekend where WWE spent half the time promoting WrestleMania and half the time bashing AEW in certain interviews. Um the thing that Osprey said in the interview with uh Renee Paquette later in the show with um, the line that he gave about uh, uh, responding to Triple H's comments about people not being uh, willing to face the grind of WWE, saying that uh, the only reason that he's in the position that he's is because he grind- grinded on the boss's daughter, was, uh, I thought that was, um, that was justified. Especially La- you- I saw a lot of people say that take, and I guess in the thought that it definitely was specifically Osprey that Triple H was referring to, I just took Triple H's comments as a general. Like, I even thought about Sasha. He's refer- I about- like, I mean, even Sean Ross sat in response to a tweet that I saw going out there about it where someone said, oh, he could have been talking about anybody. Sean Ross sat replied to it saying, oh, come on. Like, is oh. uh, every- everyone who's who knows enough knows that he was specifically referring to Will Ospreay with that tweet or, or that comment in that uh, Pat McAfee interview because... Uh, he can't be. He wouldn't be referring to Okada because Okada's thing. Okada apparently was never really in negotiation with WWE anyway. Yeah. Mercedes Monet was all about the money issue, and then Osprey's the only one of those big free agents that said that he negotiated with WWE or spoke to them, and apparently was like very kind of respectful about it, but said that this is what his priorities were, and WWE weren't willing to match it or pay the amount of money that he w- wanted to kind of compensate that. And then he went to A and W instead, and the, there was also um, the Wrestling Observer newsletter that came out today went into more detail about this, saying that um, Will Ospreay had said explicitly to WWE during negotiations that the reason why he wanted to stay in the UK is because that he had his um, he has his, um, his girlfriend, stepson. yeah, girlfriend and stepson Alex Windsor, and also the fact that he wanted to stay with them because Alex Windsor's husband uh, died four years ago, and that she's kind of still processing that loss and so he feels like he needs to continue to be close to his family and so he kind of basically took triple h's comments as a bit of a personal attack considering the fact that he made that stuff very open and clear during negotiations with them and the fact that triple h kind of boiled it down to the grind aspect well then, yeah. that. well like look with that context uh, then i have we right to say, yeah, one hundred percent. Fuck them. Yeah, and, and I say, I, I say, I'm not, I, I'm not saying when I say that that's triple, that was Triple H's intention. But I can understand Will Ospreay's reaction to it if that's the case. 
so yeah, no, i get that so i can understand ross bray doing that and i thought that was a funny line and that's just a one-off line so that's like nothing major associated with it but the whole the, the vote in what like 10 15 minutes of tv time to this to this whole clip and building a whole angle around this clip was just you know it, as i say it's a waste of valuable time and it achieved nothing long-term beneficial for the company bro you yeah. could have put lee moriarty in the ring for that extra time like <laughs> But I also feel like uh, the reason why I think that they were di- um, they were copyright striking is not because they wanted to erase the footage. I think it's because they wanted to make sure that if, if you wanted to watch the footage, you had to go watch the show. But it's also like not in the yeah, it's not in the, it's in the YouTube clip. No, I think that I think no, I think that at that point they realised they fucked up, and then okay. and then and then decided to. But I think the initial copyright strike was because they wanted people to go and watch the replay of the show. Because that, and basically you say like, oh, this is the only place you could actually see what the where the footage was. So, but I think, but as I say, overall, Robbie's completely right in what he said. This is the dumbest thing they've done as a company. I hope that it's a lesson that they learn from, and it's not the trough they go down. It's definitely not a company killer. It's definitely not uh, what some people are coining it as like a WCW two thousand move. Because fundamentally, this is the first real, uh, well, not the first real stupid thing, but one of the biggest stupid things that AEW has done. Uh, this was like a weekly occurrence in WCW in 2000, so I don't I think we're there. I hope it's not going to become a weekly occurrence. Oh, yeah, because... like that's the fear. Is like that, let's not I, make this a thing. I think that I think the sign that they've taken it off of the YouTube clip, and the sign that I think that's like that, well, I mean, the first thing that Tony Khan kind of is tweeted out since that point. I've, I've been talking about the rating was the um, just putting out that Will Ospreay is going to fight Claudio Castagnoli next week on Dynamite. Is him just saying, "Yeah, I fucked up. Here's a great match." Let's move on. That yeah, kind of, I, I responded to that with a, with a gif of like, this is what we've been waiting for. Because if you're going to do the whole, well, we wrestle best here or whatever, like, yeah, then do that. Because my dream is a, a world where, hey, WWE is fun. Hey, AEW is fun. Hey, even TNA is good. Like, you can have it all. Honestly, you can. Because they sell different programs. So Ideally, don't... they would be they would have different feels to them, and they would have different approaches for like, hey, if you want to work here, then this is the benefit for working here, and this is the benefit for working there, and this is the benefit for working there. And then if you're a fan, hey, if you want to watch more like, if you want to watch more of like the AEW style match, you watch AEW. If you want to watch WWE type like more sports entertainment type stuff, you watch WWE. If you want to watch more of like a you know southern wrestling type of thing, you watch NWA. Although I don't know if anybody does. <laughs> and, no. uh, but here's my my fear about to, the sorry. whole the idea <laughs> of um like of the potential of it going forward. This isn't the first time that we've seen this type of a response. It's this is the worst out of all those, but like it seems like there's been more and more of this very bitter, like everything's taking, uh, getting taken personally on Tony Khan's end from the past like year or so. Like he's talked on, you know, the press conferences and everything about like, well, you know, did, did you have to do that during this week? It was a tough week for me. I forget exactly what the week was or whatever. And we had talked about it then. It was like, yeah, there's ways that you can do things that maybe doesn't get in the way. And sometimes, companies do things specifically to mess with people and then other times they don't and if you interpret it that way and you stoke a fire even more then you kind of and it happens in real life too outside of pro wrestling uh i mean pro wrestling's real life for these guys too but like you know you could be in a situation with like a friend of yours where it's like ah they didn't you know say uh, they didn't call me on my birthday and wish me happy birthday and then you're mad at them and then they're like why are they not talking to me and they don't know that you're mad at them for that because they sent you a text message that didn't get delivered and they don't know it like there's miscommunications that happen and stuff but it seems like a difference that i i feel like you know with the will osprey thing i'm watching the the dynamite episode and i'm like all right i'm already going into this with the the footage probably being a bad idea and we previously had the whole thing the week or two before where Adam Copeland started it off and it's like, I'm going to cut a promo to defend AEW. And at the end of it, 
Dax had cut a promo defending AEW and people had mentioned the other things here and there. And I'm like, crap, is AEW going to be like every week now it's going to be, how do I defend AEW? Whereas I don't see as much on WWE's front when they do those things. And like they did them, they certainly did them, uh, the AEW shots during WrestleMania week, but those were outside of the programming. So if you didn't watch the interviews, you're not having to, sit through that as much whereas like i don't i don't want to see that on aew's television unless it's a good enough shot that it's fun we talked about that before too like i want the petty shots to be fun the will osprey line it's such old hat like how many times are we going to get to the well of yeah, you're only in there because of stephanie and it's like all right th- that joke's 20 years old is that it like I don't know. I wanted a, more of a zinger, you know. And I, I don't like the idea of if we get something going forward with Dynamite next week, and it ends up being like, let's respond to the response of the AEW All In footage, and then we have like Dax cut another promo again or whatever, and then somebody else says another like, ah, take that WWE, and then like then it it kind of comes off more obsessive. And I don't think that that looks good for AEW either. So I'm really hoping that they do move on and just, you know, if you if you put on a good enough product, people are going to watch. And if you distract them enough with quality entertainment, they're not going to be worried about any of those other things. And WWE too. Like WWE shouldn't just constantly have to fire back either. So I'm expecting them to do something. But if anybody does, I kind of expect it to be a little like, like if it's, if it's not punk, I don't know who would do any kind of a shot. I mean, I know that there were some people tweeting out, uh, what was it? Grayson Waller had tweeted out something prior to this about like, oh, I'm going to air oh, footage me. of whatever. And yeah. it's like, oh, uh, no, that was very funny. like you kind of stoking the fire a little bit too. And like, I don't know. That's, but I, I don't mind the petty shit. I, I want them to be taking shots at each other almost constantly. Just don't do it on TV shows. Right. Do it on, yeah. Do it on Twitter. Do it in like interviews outside of it. If people don't want to, like, people don't care about it, then they don't have to get involved. If people do care about it, they can get involved. But it's like but I yeah, like the just, angle of like Drew McIntyre and them being mad at Punk coming in and being like, "You're a cancer to the locker room, and I don't like you." Turning that into a story. I don't like if we have on SmackDown tonight, uh, Cody cuts a promo and he's like, here's uh, my my grievances about AEW. I'll be like, dude, I don't care. Come on. <laughs> what, what's going on with your title? Like, yeah, I, I'm yeah. hoping that AEW doesn't make this a regular thing because then they're going to start really looking like that WCW 2000 or, you know, TNA back in the day where they constantly just talked about WWE and uh, that's not a good look for them. They need to move forward and they need to be better than that. AEW at its best is a number two promotion that isn't worried about the fact that it's number two. It's just providing the best alternative. AEW at its worst is apparently far too focused on being Proving why they shouldn't be the number two. Yeah. Like, or you know, in some instances, trying to get sympathy for uh number one is picking on me yeah and it's like i I would have rather if you're gonna do any airtime with the young bucks i would have rather them or on the whiteboard or something have written congrats to our friend for finishing the story like i'd rather them do something like that than do this thing where it seems like they're trying to dig punk but also that didn't really dig punk because no one thought that punk was being totally he was in a saint going into this or, you know like, yeah i i, I kind of take a like the side of you absolutely right in terms of that they shouldn't be focusing the tv programming around this stuff because it's just you say like, it does look desperate and it's not helping in terms of the build towards their big shows so that's they need to kind of check this 
I do think that they shouldn't be expected that if WWE fire shots, they shouldn't be expected to be the bigger person, not fire back. Oh yeah, I, I agree but I think, with that but I, but I think that that again, it should be restricted to just in the same way that WWE lies media interviews and clips online to do that. I mean, AEW should take the same sort of approach. As I say, I, I was totally on board with them uh, presenting the footage, but I think that he should just link to the media instead. And that, and then that could have like leak it to TMZ of... and let TMZ put a little yeah, watermark exactly, yeah. on it or something. Yeah, essentially, just go go from there. And then, uh, so yeah, I think that there is some kind of not among us, obviously, because we know better, but among certain people that like AEW just needs to kind of take this stuff and not respond. And because just for this, just be, just for the reason that they weren't there first, like WWE's been around for ages, so AEW just needs to take it because they're not. They're not number one. So if if WWE fires, then AEW has to take it. If AEW take fires, then they're seen as like, oh, what are you doing? You're so unprofessional. Whereas WWE kind of get an easier ride with it. And well, also, in the same I, regard, when you're punching down, you look pitiful sometimes yeah. too. And it's like WWE, if if you are you know the big company and all, you don't need to be as concerned. So yeah. why bother mentioning it? And I'd also say the line, and I, some people would obviously take up to this well, and I know people would say this, like, oh, it's because I'm a much more bigger AEW fan than WWE fan. But it's not even the case of WWE. It's just a general such a statement that I believe is the case that I don't think there's ever been a wrestling promotion that has received more vitriol and hate for just existing than AEW has in history. Just because... Because I think the majority of people that do all these bad faith takes towards it just hate the fact that another company exists and that the monopoly was broken. Because I, I think it's you've been fed for 20 years at least that oh, any company that comes is just trying to hurt us and take away your family entertainment, which is silly too, yeah. by the way. Any, but, yeah, but, so, I mean, we always talk about how the tribalism stuff is... Oh yeah, absolutely. stupid, and we we hate that crap. And like, but I it's, despite it's, me having that urge to merge, that's mostly because I just want the people that I like all in the same thing, and it make it easier for me. It's not as much uh, to be like uh, no other companies can exist. I'm like, put all the people that I don't like on the other companies, and that's cool. <laughs> yeah, but but it's just a case of I can I can understand how it can potentially all this stuff kind of builds up to get the response that it got. Not saying, not justifying it by any stretch of the imagination, but I can understand where that feeling comes from. And so I think that, as I say, he's done it now. There's no going back from it. Hopefully Tony Khan sees that it was the wrong move or the wrong play at that particular time. And we, and it is actually, he puts his focus back on what he does best, which is matchmaking and putting on like a good alternative product. So that's kind of, I think, where we can kind of draw the line with this. It was a dumb thing. And it will definitely be like one of the worst moments of the year in the end of year awards for AEW. Oh, oh yeah, I already have it down on my list. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, but, but, but yeah, hopefully hopefully this is the worst thing that happens this year for AEW. Hopefully it's the worst thing that happens in AEW. Ever, for AW, in AEW history, yeah. yeah. So this, is prob- this is probably high up there. I think it's it's this and it's the end of the, um, the, uh, the barbed wire explosion death match and the Matt Hardy concussion thing. Yeah, and you know, I yeah. mean, obviously, like any company is going to have like errors and that stuff, moment, and yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. like yeah. like Jimmy Havoc was a part of the company and stuff, but like, man, I I do kind of miss the days when you know a couple of years ago when it was like, ah, we don't really see anything really with Tony Khan. It's just sort of, <laughs> you know, and it, it's been a very he's a bigger Tony bigger Khan. deal now. Yeah, yeah he's, a bigger, he's a bigger deal now. And like, the more that, that he be, like becomes out there, the more that I'm like, I don't know, it's not always good. So. <laughs> Some, I think he, uh, some ways he's, it's he's good. Still, he's still not like a real TV character, though, which no. I guess is to benefit. At least he's a bit hidden in that regard. But like, but yeah, I think that, yeah, I think you should just go back to focusing on what he does best because then AEW does its best work at that point. So hopefully it's just a case of we don't ever bring this up ever again. And if, if CM Punk or WWE respond to it, AEW could just, you know, I think in this instance to just turn the other cheek and just move on. Because there's no point really relitigating this stuff again, because then, Most. because then, because then the next thing that will happen is that they'll find some sort of footage to put out about brawl out, and then that, and then everything will, and then and then Twitter will implode probably. Well, the thing, is, so if they went that far, because 
my biggest issue with them doing this was like, yeah, I wanted that when he was in your company and you could do the program. You can't do the program anymore. There's no real point to it. And people, I saw people being like, oh, this happened plenty of times in the Monday Night Wars. No, it didn't. WCW never aired footage of Brett knocking out Vince. They called him a knockout guy. They alluded to it. But like they never just said, hey, look at this footage. Fuck him. You know, like I think that's it, it just wasn't a good look. And more than anything, and this is personal because I'm probably seeing more than you are, but like I just I just didn't like a lot of the responses I saw and it showed the kind of crowd that wrestling attracts and it makes you go, Oh, I don't want to be grouped in with these people. <laughs> you know, so you, like, you were seeing those bad responses. You missed out on the horrible racist Javon Evans one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, another talking point. Cause I don't want to go on too long. We're already uh, almost a two hour mark, but um, I don't know much about the legalities behind this stuff, but somebody had pointed out something about UK law having uh, something. I, I, I'm not going to do it justice because I don't remember what the hell it was, but they were like, Oh, there's a way that, like, I guess, like, Punk or like, maybe even, like, Jack Perry and stuff, if they wanted to, could, like, cause a fuss over this or something, which I don't think is going to end up happening. I think that that's, like, we would have heard something about that by now if that already was going to be the case. But um, I do... You'd be dumb for wanting to open the can of worms like that. Yeah, I, I do question, though, how you make the story something else to talk about from this and how you head into dynasty without this just being the black cloud over all of it. Because if I'm somebody at like a press conference or a media call, I'm not as interested to ask, well, what do you think you're going to do with Julia Hart being injured as I am the AEW all in footage? And that I think is also another big mistake is doing that right before a pay-per-view. Cause that's just the discussion's not as much on dynamite uh, dynasty anymore. Whereas part of this was supposed to be like, let's build up this FTR match. Is anybody right now talking about seeing a wrestling classic between the young bucks and the FTR again in their fourth match? Or are they talking about the footage? I think that's a major misstep. I, I tell you what, the footage will come in handy and whenever WWE wants to pull the trigger on Cody versus Punk and, you know, Cody can say something to the effects of, you've always had it out to, you know, try to take down everything I built from the ground up and you're not taking my title. You know what I mean? Like, it only works and benefits to people who can use CM Punk. That's not when when are we going to see CM Punk reenact it with somebody like Drew McIntyre? <laughs> Just like a, a backstage, uh, you know, footage from backstage from NXT Anonymous or something. <laughs> That's exactly what it would be. It'd be you know what it, you know what it'd be if he's fighting Seth. It's Nathan Frazier, who was trained by Seth. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, maybe it's a GTV comes back and starts fair in footage. So, uh, any other thoughts about this before we wrap it up? I hope we never have to talk about this again. I know we will, <laughs> but I, I don't want to. <laughs> yeah, I don't, I don't want to bring up this sort of thing again on this particular show. On, 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 like, hopefully, we don't have to discuss anything to do with brawl out or, or brawl in, in ever again. Really, I think we can. I think we hopefully can move on from it. It's just, a, well, we can move on for it. It's just whether they can. Well, next week, we, of course, are going to have NXT. Uh, not NXT. Well, I'm looking at NXT Bring on my Rowan, screen. Gonna... <laughs> I'm looking at NXT on my uh, screen right now. That's why I just read that. Um, jumping straight to May 22nd with NXT Battleground. No, um, we're going to be talking about AEW Dynasty. Um, I hope that uh, things have changed around and all that. And we're not just doing a fan ounce table of that footage or something. But um, following that, we're going to have our draft week, Fantasy League mock draft, as well as preview of the WWE draft in one way or another. Um, we've got 
of course, another um, round of the hot tags in between there and everything. So as we go along for this next week, we'll be eyes on AEW Dynasty pay-per-view point coming up immediately after that event on the weekend. Stay tuned. Keep all that stuff going. Have your subscriptions and email alerts and all that stuff set up. If you don't know what to do I, by now, then I, I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> um, we're not we're not going to talk at all about when you see it right then. Oh, I thought what you already, already said I thought that might have been something I missed. Well, I, 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 I mean, there's a whole card stuff like what we haven't talked about what the actual matches are. I thought that you had already like chimed in with your thoughts on that. Have you got someone else? Well, to no, go no, for it? What, what, what is that? Well, it's the whole show. Like the whole show is quite close, but we like we only really talked about Moxley against Naito being at Windy City. No, like the the show that's happening tonight for New Japan Pro Wrestling. Yeah, it's tonight. That's why I said I wanted yeah. Moxley to win the belt and come back on Wednesday. Yeah, there's loads of other matches on the show as well. So I thought we'd we'd kind of preview that a little uh, bit. If you, if you got something, go for it. I, I don't know yeah. anything about it. All right, so uh, I'll, I mean, I'll, I'll do it quickly because I know we've been going on for a while. So I'll, I'll skip through most of the matches that don't really matter, like, you know, Minoru Suzuki versus Ren and Rhea. That's fine. It's just like a match. Stephanie Vickers is defending the strong women's championship against Azumi. That should be fine. Um, so the the big matches that people would care about would be Show Room and I versus Jack Perry. Yeah, that, that should be very fun. And I uh, just like the, ima- the imagine the Chicago crowd's reaction to Jack Perry should be massive and Cho Rumino will probably win because Jet Perry's leaving to go back to AEW. Uh Hiromi Takahashi versus Mr. Farah Lee. Um it's not for the X Division title. Uh That's a miss. I that would be well, good. Well to miss if Ali's winning, I, that might mean that Takahashi's winning, but they don't want him to be the, the, in, the uh X Division champion. I think um not not like a big thing for this, but I think Ali's run on the independent circuit has been a massive flop. Uh, he he's this whole um, presidential he really gimmick, likes this, doing this, whole... this yeah this whole presidential gimmick he's got going on is shit, and it's just like it it's completely against what made his character popular in WWE in the first place. I don't know why he's insisting on using it because it sucks. I mean, people are digging it, but like people always do. Mm. Uh. I, I assume that there would have been Eddie Kingston versus Gabe Kid for the strong championship. What they're actually doing is an eight man tag riot rules match, which is Eddie and three comp- and three tag team partners, which haven't been named against Gabe Kid and three tag team partners that haven't been named. So I guess it's just like a mystery thing about who's Eddie Kingston got to team with him and who's Gabe Kid got to team with him. I imagine with Gabe Kid, at least one of them will be like War Dogs related, but you never know. But I imagine that Gabe Kid's team is going to win that and then he'll get his title shot. Somewhere down the line, because Eddie Kingston needs to lose that that belt, other belt, to continue the story. Uh, Matt Riddle's defending the television championship against Zack Sabre Jr. This is a this is a lose lose situation because other, otherwise, because the other result is Matt Riddle keeps holding the title, which he shouldn't be holding because he's never really around that much. Uh, and Zach Sabre Jr. shouldn't be holding the television title because he should be moving on to the World Championship or something like that. And so either result is bad. So that's good. Uh, and then Nick Nemeth, ex Dolph Ziggler, is against Tomohiro Ishii. He's not even putting his title on the line. So it's not even for the Global Championship, it's just a singles match. And uh, yeah, we'll see how Nick Nemeth does against the guy who just only has good matches for New Japan. And then Knight vs. Moxley is the big one. Uh, I, I think Moxley's going to win the title. But I think Moxley should win the title. I really I do. Think, I, I think he should, but we'll, we'll see how it goes, because uh, Naito's, Naito's doing well as champion in New Japan, and the crowd's kind of... And, and they're getting like good numbers in terms of crowds off the back of that. And obviously, if Moxley holds the title, it means the title won't be in Japan as regularly. But um, I think you build up towards a Moxley versus Naito rematch at Forbidden Door or Dominion or something. But, uh, but yeah, I'd like to see. I'd, I think it would be interesting to see Moxley win the title. I think that would make him the first guy to hold the IWGP, WWE, and AEW titles. So that would be a bit of a feather in his cap. So then last thing to mention then, uh, just like give a percentage-wise, uh, how do you both imagine the chances that he ends up winning that championship? 
I'm going to say 70-30, he wins it. I, I'm, I'm very much 50-50. I think there's there's benefits on both sides. It just depends on whether AEW, whether New Japan is willing to give up their their world championship to AEW for a little while, really. I'm going to say he doesn't. I, uh... Uh, uh, Forbidden Door is not that far off. It's only uh, June, so it would only be a two-month run if that was the case. I, I don't think he'd hold it longer than that because he's definitely not doing the G1. And it could very well be that that's as easy as it is. It's just he defends that against some New Japan guy and loses at a Forbidden Door. You know, I'm going to say uh, I'm gonna say 60-40. I'll give him between the two of you guys <laughs> instead of the 50-50 and the 70-30. I'll go 60-40, Moxley wins. Yeah, well, uh, uh, it'll be. It'll, I think it should be a fun show. I'm definitely watching it as soon as we're, as soon as we're off this. And by the time people hear this, they already know what the results are anyway, probably. But it's it's worth previewing because I think it'll be a fun show. Oh, of course, we'll talk about that in next week's hot tags too, and anything else that happens on SmackDown tonight, on Raw, uh, Dynamite, NXT, whatever it might be, or just the news cycle, you know. Uh, where we'll get into snack talk and talk food. I don't know. <laughs> we still, uh, we could get more into that ravioli discussion and stuff we did before. Uh, anything else, of course, that happens. If you guys want to try uh, in with your thoughts in the comment section below and get your opinions out there, go ahead and do so. And we will keep it all rolling. So that means you can join the discord and, you know, chat things up about things uh, over there. I don't know why I had an accent there where I said things, but I did. We're moving on from there. <laughs> We've got, of course, uh, everything over on fanboysanonymous.com. I don't have anything necessarily planned 100% because that's something that I just, when I find the time to do those things, I do. But I'm always working on things here and there. You know, I find myself recently adding a lot of notes to the Superman blueprint just with like, uh, you know, hype over the new Superman movie and stuff. Um, Linktree, of course amagotree.com anthonymago.com you'll find all those different accounts that you should be following whether you are on any of those platforms hit the like button or the follow button or something it helps me out quite a bit and you know chat it up and send me tweets and facebook messages and stuff like that and while you're following me follow robin callum too yep follow me everywhere at do felice you can check out my work on fightful.com you can check out everything at fightful.com and Anything else I got going on? You guys will probably hear about it first here. So you can find me on Twitter at Wigmeister14. You can check out the Power Rankings this weekend, where it'll be the first edition of the new season, where you'll see people ranked based on their performances at WrestleMania and stand and deliver, most likely. Well, that'll be the main thing, main driving force for their position on the rankings. And as mentioned, there's no... Uh, fantasy league just yet but it will be coming back very soon in the next couple of weeks where we'll be drafting our teams with the first points being picked up at backlash so so stay tuned for all that stuff to see the return of the fantasy league with a and a slightly different format changing it up a little bit if you of course want to know all the results of the fantasy league from the past go to the wiki if you don't know what the wiki is uh because i don't think i have links all over the place but uh it's mark a moment wiki google it (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> or ask me in the comments. I'll leave a comment or something. But that's it for the hot tags for this week, everybody. Of course, we want to thank you for tuning in, and we will see you next time. But for now, this has been another Smart Count Moment, and we're being counted out.